Thanks for the uh, tweets. Uh, I'll get back to the most latest one in a second. Um, first question, Sang, what about uh, lesions in the splenic flexure? Have you done anybody? Or I'll ask, open to the panel. Anybody worked on splenic flexure lesions? Can you get to it? How do you do that? Um, yeah, I mean, you have to mobilize the colon. Uh, you, have to free, you have to mobilize the splenic flexure first. And oftentimes, in the very angle, angulated portion of the colon, difficulty is not the size usually, but just the location. So by straightening out that area, and you can also guide the uh, colonoscope right onto the uh, polyp, and you can, you can certainly do it much easier. So in your series, how many do you think were in the splenic flexure? Very few. Like two or three, right? Yeah. Because most of the time, thankfully, most of us don't find too many we don't get many polyps in the splenic flexure. Anybody else have experience, Larry, experience with the splenic flexure? Maybe, maybe one. Uh, I, don't, I mean, we've had hepatic flexure. That's more common. Yeah. I think just mobilizing the colon is a good idea if you have trouble. All right. A question to the group. If, you've, if somebody's done a prior attempt at uh, piecemeal excision and they don't get all the polyp out and they send it to you, is that somebody who you think is going to do well with this uh, combined approach? Saying input? Yeah, I mean, I'll I think it's worth a look. So, I mean, if, if you know, also depends on how much of the polyp is remaining as well. Um, you know, one of our criteria is saline lift, and if you're concerned at all about just not lifting with the saline lift and it's scarred down, I, I'd rather probably uh, be on a more conservative side and then do a, uh, a colectomy and, rather than persisting with this combined method. Uh, I think, you know, it's worth taking a look because sometimes they've tried, we've, we've found those that have been worked on that will lift. So I, th I think it's, it's worth, uh, it's not a big deal to repeat the endoscopy. If you're, even if you're planning on a, you know, uh, on a recession, you can still, you have it anyway and you check it out and you'd be surprised sometimes you can do it. But it, it is a problem for sure. I, I agree. We've had a number of patients who've been referred in who've had, you know, annual colonoscopies. Every time finding a polyp at the same exact location, removing it, and then finally, after about three or four times, referring it in, saying it's an intractable polyp, you know. I think it's worth trying. You just never know, but it's, right. it predicts the, failure. Those, those are, and I would tell you, my own personal experience is that those do predict failure, that if somebody's done four polypectomies over five years in the same site, the likelihood of you getting this off without having to do, maybe you can get a wedgie, but, but with that, we're trying to get it off even, you know, in the OR with an assisted is going to be very difficult because you're not going to have much room. So I think uh, sometimes that's the only uh, option available. Sang, do you still use the gastroenterologist in the OR coming to help, or, or do you do it now? People want to know, do you need two, two docs in there? Well, initially when we started doing this, we would invite gastroenterologists uh, into the OR. They, call, they come for the first time and then never come back. <laughs> So typically now, nowadays, you know, I do the endoscopic part and have the resident uh, do the laparoscopic part. Right. Do you, do you put the laparoscope in initially, always? So it really depends on the uh, polyp. Um, you know, if it's something that I think I can get it just endoscopically, oftentimes I would just scope the patient first, and then a lot of times I can just get the polyp out without doing any laparoscopic assistance. Uh, if it's a very large polyp, you know, and then in which case, in tough location, I, I put the laparoscope in and then put the uh, colonoscope in afterwards. There's a question on, which is a very good question, about coding. How, how are you coding for these procedures, and do you have any idea about re reimbursement when you do these combined lap endo procedures? Larry, what do, what do you do? No, you lose money on this. You're not going to, you know, the... Uh, you can you bill for a you can exploratory laparoscopy. You can do that, and, and which is supposed to be a separate procedure. And then you also can bill for the endoscopy, injection of subucosal, you know, material in the subucosal layer, and or a very difficult polypectomy. But I think uh, you, you know you're you're taking something that has a reimbursement already that's not great, and we're making it maybe less. So that's one of the issues is the reimbursement. What have, well, what have you done, Peter, or, or saying? What, how have you guys? I mean, I've, I've done it that way, and also uh, sometimes I code it as uh, unlisted laparoscopic procedure, and then I would charge equivalent to right colectomy, laparoscopic right colectomy. And, and how often insurance is that? companies actually have been paying it, so. I can tell you, Leahy, what, what I've done is that uh, I bill for a diagnostic laparoscopy as the primary procedure, and the secondary procedure is colonoscopy with saline lift and, and uh, polypectomy. And I've gotten, on average, about $1,200. Uh, it's been plus and minus, but that's this, that's going to be less than what you're probably going to get for a right colectomy laparoscopically, but it's still something more than what you get for doing colonoscopy. And I think in the end, you're trying to benefit the patients, but also looking at it from the other side that you're not going to get nothing uh, when this comes back. Rob, uh, question for you. Uh, uh, right, right colectomy post-op day one or three starts to bleed. Do you rescope that patient? 
Yeah, I would. Uh, Microphone? Yes. Yeah, I would scope that patient. Uh, I think that uh, it's safe to do. I would use uh, low insufflation. I'd use CO2. We use CO2 routinely even in our endo unit uh, as well as EOR, and I think that that, uh, that makes that a nice approach. Uh, I Mike, think it's important because you, you know, remember that uh, bleeding predicts leak. We know that for, from pretty good data. So if they're bleeding, they also may be an imminent leak, and you can often figure out that when you rescope them. So. Uh, questions relate to a um, uh, technique of, the, of doing a wedge saying, do you, Larry talked about marking the four sites, or do you use stitches? How do you, how do you then figure out what, what's coming out? Yeah, I mean, I, I think ideally you want to uh, shorten the bowel as opposed to narrowing it. So if it's on the right side close to the cecum on the anterior surface, what I like to do sometimes, uh, mark out the, uh, uh, the margins uh, with the tattoo. And then uh, you can laparoscopically place suture and you use that as a guide. And then you can, that, that way you can come across it transversely rather than longitudinally. Yeah, I've also done that also where you have the endoscope on the inside and I actually, the, 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 you actually place the stitch on the far side so you can actually see the needle go through and know that you're in the right spot. Then place the stitch on the near side. That usually then lifts up. It, it requires four trocars. But that lifts up and try to, tries to help ensure that your wedge is going to have all the polyp because the last thing you want is to have part of the polyp in the staple line. Uh, that's, I haven't encountered that. Larry, has that happened to you yet? No, but we uh, you very, worry about it. very close, very close. Yeah. If, they're, if they're in the cecum, knowing where they are in relation to the appendix orifice often keeps you out of trouble and obviates the need for that. But if they're away from that area, then you've got to use those kind of techniques. The thing is that a lot of these polyps, though, are, are fairly close to the, uh, are closer than you think to the valve. Uh, appendix orifice ones, depending on where the appendix is, can be, uh, we've, we found it, we're surprised at how often the, uh, Getting a, laying a stapler between the lesion and saving the, the, ilia, the uh, valve is, is not possible. Now, Larry, I, I know you've done this for polypoid lesions, you know, not just the flat little polyp that we see, but polypoid lesions. Saying, have you done this also for lesions that are, you know, that stick up, like good CM or so above, you know, polyps that are sent to you, or are you sticking mainly more to the flat polyps? Are you talking about combined procedures? Combined procedures, yeah. any combined procedure. Will you do it for a more pedunculated polyp? Yes. Okay. Mike? I, I'll stay out of the OR with those if I can. I mean, the thing, Larry, we, go ahead. We've done seven centimeter, big, giant things that look like it's the entire lumen filled up, and you and you push it around, and you realize that in fact that you get down to a base that may be two and a half centimeters. So if you can, we think if you can trim that, that you could then do an ESD, and we've done that. However, we've had three cases where we've done that, and all the frozen sections we send pieces. The you know pathologists are not too happy when we do these cases because they're in there all day doing frozen sections. But the, uh, they came back as a little negative, and in the end, the final pathology was showed cancer, so we went, we went back. Even though it was just a small foci, we felt we needed to do a resection and did a formal resection on a second day, and all of them came back fully negative. But we, you can do big things. The question is, it, what, what are the chances of you finding some cancer that may change your, you know, may, may, may uh, indicate a, a more, a more uh, uh, standard resection? So I don't know the answer to that, but, but it may be that uh, um, those are too big. But Larry, I'm mean, just look. Uh intrigued by your data, so I think you had about a 40% incidence of cancer for the high-grade dysplasia, but that means 60% don't have cancer, so why not just wait for the final pathology to come back? You, don't, you really don't compromise anything by waiting three days, because all you've done is a, you know, a glorified appendectomy. I think most people, you know, we gear them up that we're going to take care of it on the, at that session. I think uh, a 40% rate of having to, to go back and do that. I, we, we've just made the decision that that's too high. When we run that by patients, patients usually are not that as interested in it. But I think you could, if you look at it the other way around, and they're not, they don't mind doing it. But, but I don't want to make it sound like these are easy, these are little, these actually take longer, some, mostly take longer than, the, uh, uh, than any kind of standard resection will do, because we're still learning how to do this. So an ESD for us is a big deal, and, I, it, and it is, they don't give a, have a resection, but, it, but I think Many of them don't look forward to a second procedure. But I mean, also considering other morphologies, I think it's very important. If you're just considering whether it's high-grade dysplasia or not, you may have high incidence. But also, in addition to that, you're looking at it, um, you know, looking at it with MBI, whether it lifts uh, with the saline lift, or whether once we take it out, whether there's, you know, the, the specimen itself is very soft. Combine all those things together, even in the setting of high-grade dysplasia, you can clinically identify which ones are cancer or not. So, I mean, I think 
um, that's another option. And I th so I think the important message is you need to have a discussion with the patient about the potential scenario of removing this endoscopically or lap assisted, and then the final path comes back, and they're going to need another operation. And I, I have that conversation with every patient that I consider any of these options with. And most patients, all they want to know is when you're done with the procedure that you get it out. And they understand that in a rare case, you may need to go back. But I think patients, patients don't want their whole right colon out if they don't need it, is what you really find. And I think in the majority, you're not going to need to go back to do the formal resection. Uh, but I think polypoid lesions with high-grade dysplasia might be a group Especially if you're just starting out, that, that's not, probably not going to be one of your first couple of cases. Right, Larry? No, I, we, th we think the displaced ones are better off treated with a colectomy. But I think it's important that the patients understand if you accomplish the minimally invasive goal of doing it in ESDMR, your chances of a, of, of a little remnant or recurrence at that site is, very, is much higher. It, it, you know, then if you do a segmental resection, if you do segmental resection, a benign polyp, there's no, no chance. chance no chance. So the point is the, uh, they need to know that, and you need to do the endoscopies. We do it at three months. I think one month is a little early. So we do it at three months, and then we will repeat it based on what we find. Yeah, saying you're doing three months? Yeah, now three months. Yeah. yeah, I'm going three to six months, because most of the time they just want to take another prep. You know, they've had, had their fill, so I just let them give it a little bit while. I'm not sure if it really makes a big difference. Question saying, is artificial tears, you know, can that, is that an injectable product? Are you going to have trouble? Does your pharmacy know what you're doing with it? Yeah, I mean, it's a, usually in a formula, it's something that's very commonly available for ophthalmologists to use. It's essentially artificial tear. So, yeah. Right, the GONAC? Yeah. Oh, go G-O-N-A-K. G-O-N-A-K. That's the product you want to get. And I, the way I look at this is, and we've gone through our pharmacy, and, and I'm going to try to get GONAC. You're using it as a product, but then you are actually taking off the mucosa. So then most of that leaches back into the space. And we don't close these defects, right? Well, nobody's closing the ESD defect, right? Well, if we, if we have a small one and we can, and we can close it, if it's... Then but, but end aluminally, are you just putting clips on the inside clips. to close it? Yep. Clips. But, but most of them you can't. And the thing is, if you've done it right, it doesn't matter. You see muscle and you're okay. Problem is, if you've got a hole, you know, some of ours look pretty ratty at the end and there's holes in the, see, you see fat and you see, oh, that's nice. You know, you've got to, you see, you need to go back and reinforce that stuff uh, on the laparoscopic side. I think there's one more. Not very pretty, some of these. What about, uh, question, carcinoids or GIFs? Wedges for those or not? For, for, a, for, a, for a GIST, yes. Yep. Carcinoid? For a carcinoid, no. If it's that big, uh, the risk of lymphatic metastasis is quite high. I mean, more than a centimeter, it starts to become significant. More than two, it's quite high. All right, six millimeter carcinoid of the right colon. Can you do a wedge? <laughs> I'm hurting you. Larry, what are you going to do? I think you probably could. I mean, if it's, if it's that small, it's not a, is it the appendiceal orifice, or where is the thing? Yeah, I don't know. Let's say it's uh, in the seek of a nice spot to do a wedge on. Would you, do, cause, would you be uh, adequately treated as a six millimeter Carcinoid. I think you'd present it to the patient and say, we do this, we may, may, we may uh, be having you back for a second procedure. Are you willing to do that? If, if they are okay with that, I would do it. Okay. And to the, that person who tweeted, uh, Dr. Finelli, stop spelling anastomosis incorrectly, he apologizes. Right, Rob? <laughs> I do. Okay, very good. Can I make one, one yeah, question? Yeah, go ahead, Larry. If you, one thing, if you find a polyp in the right colon that you can get out, but you find six or seven small polyps in the, in the right colon as well, they may be, all be very doable, but we think if, that, if you've got a colon that's that prone to form polyps like that, um, we think that probably is best treated with the right hemi versus, you know, even though each individual one may be good, you're going to be back in a year and you're going to have another six polyps. And, and, so if, and if the patient's 80 years old and it's their first scope, you still feel that way or does it depend a little bit on the patient's age and how many scopes they've had before? 80s in my practice is young. <laughs> so <laughs> but young my sir. point is in index scope versus they've had previous scopes. No, if it's their index scope, then, and, and they're, then that's, that's fine. But usually that's not the case. It's usually the other way around, that they've, the guy already took out seven polyps when he was in, and then you find another bunch, and then, or even if you find two. And then it's not, again, it's not the method that you want to employ. It's the best treatment for the patient in that, that setting, probably. And often those patients have nothing in the transverse on. There's nothing else distally. It's all right. So anyway, that's just what we were. All right, one last quiz for you guys, uh, and then I'm going to end it. Uh, there's a, you, yourself, have a two and a half centimeter polyp, sessile, in your cecum. You need to do something. Your options are A, uh, a laparoscopic right colectomy, B, a lap assisted endoscopic polypectomy, C, a lap wedge, or D, a lap ESD. Okay? So you got a two and a half centimeter polyp in your own colon. 
What do you want? Do you want a lap right? Who wants a lap right? Where is it? Right colon. Okay, right colon. Who wants a lap assisted endoscopic polypectomy? Couple? Yeah, great. Thank you. Give the talk. You have to put it up. Who wants a lap wedge if the lumen isn't going to be compromised? I might go for the wedge. That's not, fair. Wedge? That's not fair. Who's going to do a lap ESD? Uh, not many, because you're looking at me like that's kind of hard, and I agree, it's really hard. And uh, at least we've given some options. Mike? E. Just an endoscopic polypectomy. Yeah. yeah. With, with the right person doing it. With the right person doing it. With the backup ready in the OR in case it's, it's there. But I mean, we, one last point is that sure, a, go ahead. although you, we talk about ESD, I always put EMR because in our hands we're doing, we, we end up doing piecemeal resection for the majority of these. The number we've gotten out intact is, is small. I mean, I, so I think as you learn, you've got to be willing to do the EMR. And, and I think with Mike's comments, we're all uh, cogent and it made sense. But, and I, but if, hopefully in the end, we get to a point where we can do it in block, which is better for the right. pathology and better for anything else. Yeah, what, what if, and Mike, what about a polyp that has low grade dysplasia on a biopsy? Do you still think that, it, that EMR is good for a polyp with the dysplasia in it? Well, my pathologists tell me that every adenoma has low grade dysplasia. So that's a little bit of a uh, semantic. Right. Oh, high grade dysplasia. High grade dysplasia. Um, should that person get a resection? Should, or or well, I would, you could I would take it off in one e, piece? I would do EMR, try to get it out of one piece. If there's no invasive cancer, it doesn't matter. If there is, they get a colectomy. What if they get, what if it comes out in four pieces and there's cancer in the polyp, can't tell a margin? But that's sessile cancer. It needs a colectomy anyway. Doesn't matter to me. All right. So but a sessile can, cancer needs a colectomy with very few exceptions. But if you had it out in one piece and it showed no invasive component, would you be happy? Well, but they can tell invasion without one piece. Yeah, if there's an invasive cancer, whether it's piecemealed or one piece, that patient in my hands gets a colectomy because the risk of lymphatic uh, involvement is at least 10%. And a right colectomy or any kind of colectomy, not a rectal operation, any kind of colectomy does not uh, uh, carry as much morbidity as a 10% risk of recurrence. All right. I agree. I mean, I think that the, the, biggest, the be biggest advantage of an end block resection is that you know your margins are good. Otherwise, you have to go, and you have to go back anyway to take a look. I mean, so I think if you can do the ESD, fine, but if, but if you can get it out any way you can get the damn thing out, yeah, then. All right, great. Wilson, thank you all for staying. I think it was a great session, and uh, we'll look forward to more in the future.